Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I want to start by telling you a little bit more about the masks we're all wearing today. These masks were created by the Mass for Missions organization. This group was started by young Vermonters with a goal of distributing over 30,000 masks statewide and encouraging Vermonters to mask up. Thanks to their work, today was declared Vermont Mass Day. After uh, and a number of events are taking place this week to stress the importance of mask wearing and getting both masks and information out to Vermonters through uh, the community partners like the Vermont Food Bank, uh, Burlington City Arts, and UVM Medical Center. I want to thank uh, Doug Altschler, a recent high school graduate who helped lead this effort. He's one example amongst many of how Vermonters are helping each other out during this pandemic. Another example is the Rossi Family Foundation, which helped us secure KN95 masks when we were in desperate need early in the pandemic and has continued to help the region secure and distribute even more of them over the last few months. Today, uh, the Foundation's Million Mass Tour is stopping in White River Junction, uh, working with local rotaries to distribute 150,000 masks in Vermont. Again, this foundation, along with the generosity of people like Donna Carpenter of Burton and Trevor Braun and the whole team at Concept2, are just a few examples of individuals, nonprofits, and businesses who have stepped up throughout this pandemic to help us with supplies or community outreach and so many other good deeds to help Vermonters through this once in a century crisis. I appreciate their work and want to once again emphasize the best way we can all show our appreciation is to stay vigilant and that will help uh, keep the case counts down. Commissioner Pichek will show you our latest uh, data shortly, uh, but it's a reminder uh, that we're not out of the woods yet because as cases uh, continue to rise throughout the region, it's critical Vermonters and our Vermont businesses follow the health department guidance, wear a mask, keep our distance, avoid crowds, wash our hands, and stay home and away from others when sick. If we take these simple steps, we'll continue to avoid the increases other states are seeing. So it's literally still in our hands and it's up to each of us individually to protect ourselves and others. So with that, I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Sherling for an update on our PPE and ventilator supplies. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. Uh, it's been a little over seven months since the uh, beginning of uh, the pandemic here in Vermont. And as we enter fall, it seemed to uh, be an appropriate time to provide a a comprehensive update on personal protective equipment and our ventilator strategy. The Medical Countermeasures Warehouse, which manages the personal protective equipment for Vermont, uh, the backup supply uh, more accurately, was activated in March to provide PPE and important medical resources and support to the overall healthcare community uh, and the emergency response community when resources are constrained uh, and demand continues to remain high as supply lines remain constrained for some items. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, the warehouse is run by the Medical Logistics Branch of the State Emergency Operations Center, the SCOC, and is staffed by the Department of Health, the Agency of Transportation, the Department of Buildings and General Services, and the Vermont National Guard. Items are delivered uh, on a statewide basis by the Agency of Transportation and the National Guard. And to date, the team that makes up this warehouse and the delivery teams uh, have distributed over 3.4 million items of personal protective equipment, ranging from nitrile gloves to gallons of hand sanitizer, some of which was decanted and put into containers from 55-gallon drums that were delivered to Vermont by our urban search and rescue team, procedure masks, uh, KN95 masks, N95 respirators, face shields, latex gloves, Tyvek coveralls, boot covers, reusable and disposable gowns, impermeable gowns and COVID test kits, uh, a variety of types that are uh, assembled at a warehouse nearby uh, by a team from the Department of Public Safety and the Vermont National Guard. In addition to the healthcare and emergency response sectors, the state has also distributed personal protective equipment to child care centers, 
in, including over 300 thermometers and 25,000 face coverings, to COVID testing sites, to state agencies for distribution to uh, constituents that were, are in need, to schools, including 1,500 uh, school nurse kits that include, included gloves, hand sanitizers, procedure masks, cloth face masks, face shields, and disposable gowns. And schools also received over a quarter of a million KN95 masks. 48,000 items were distributed to mass transit companies to allow this sector to uh, remain in service and open so that they were able to, uh, to give masks to uh, riders if they did not have them prior to boarding uh, mass transportation. Polling places have received PPE, including 300 election kits with approximately 400,000 items, ranging from gloves to hand sanitizers to masks to protect poll workers and voters. And the Department of Corrections has received over 42,000 items to uh, support their ongoing operations. Statewide, there was an operation to distribute cloth face coverings to all Vermonters. Over 400,000 uh, masks were distributed or face coverings were distributed. Uh, to 215 municipalities, that represents approximately 85% of community cities and towns. Emergency medical service organizations also received uh, cloth face coverings, as did food distribution sites, the National Guard, colleges, state employees, uh, child care centers, schools, the Vermont Food Bank, and the Department of Corrections. Overall, the strategy is to continue to acquire personal protective equipment, uh, to support ongoing operations in anticipation of any additional surges and to support ongoing operations. We're working with a, uh, a target of 60-day supply and 60-day additional supply. So 60 days on hand and 60 days in reserve is the overall targets. And for many items, uh, we're in good shape on the overall target. For others, we're approaching the target, uh, the, the base target of 60 days. But there are areas that remain constrained. In particular, N95 masks, for example, we have 58 days of supply based on the current distribution rate. Uh, surgical gowns remain constrained. And probably the area uh, that's most constrained uh, that has the most turnover in product with uh, 5.3 million uh, nitrile gloves on hand. But that only represents a 37-day supply at the current burn rates for uh, the warehouse. Regarding ventilators. Uh, you'll recall that at one point we had as many as 450 or so ventilators on order. As a result of uh, new experience with the virus and uh, treatment modalities and the continued uh, constrained supply lines for ventilators, um, the, the overall orders have been diminished to roughly 120. About 83 of those ventilators have now arrived. None are in service for uh, COVID patients but are currently in reserve um, for any surge that may occur and 45 additional ventilators remain on order. Again, uh, this is an enormous effort by a team uh, made up of a variety of state agencies, the National Guard, and much of it would not be possible without the support of uh, businesses and private citizens that the governor's mentioned, including Burton, um, Concept2, Ted Rossi, and the Rossi Foundation, and Rossi Lumber. Uh, and I want to, uh, in particular, uh, give um, some credit to the University of Vermont Medical Center and their supply chain team led by Charlie Michelli, uh, who convenes meetings with uh, all of the hospitals on a regular basis and helps to coordinate uh, and vet the purchase of uh, personal protective equipment to ensure we're getting the right items uh, and the right quantities for uh, all Vermonters to support this effort. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Mike Pichak, the Commissioner at the Department of, of Financial Regulation, and we'll be presenting our weekly uh, data presentation. As always, you can follow along at dfr.vermont.gov. Uh, it has this week's presentation as well as all of our previous presentations as well. Um, similarly, we will start with some national data, but quickly turn to regional data as we are seeing upticks across the area that uh, we're keeping a close eye on. And then we'll transition back to our Vermont data, uh, talk a little bit about flu-specific uh, data and information that we have to date, I think which will be interesting and useful and provide also um, an updated forecast uh, for the uh, weeks ahead. So starting with the uh, national data, you'll see um, the national map. 
Certainly, there are still some areas of uh, great concern across the country, particularly North and South Dakota, Wisconsin, other places in the Midwest and even in the South. Generally, the United States continues to trend between 40,000 and 45,000 cases a day. Uh, this week, uh, we're up uh, 6 percent compared to two weeks ago. So again, those cases are trending up slowly. And even if they're not trending up, they are staying at a stable level that's still quite high uh, when you consider the totality of the pandemic and where cases had been um, in March uh, and uh, sorry, in May and June. Looking at the more regional data, you can see that uh, in each one of our census blocks, the cases are going up. They're not quite as significant as previous points, but they are all going up, again, indicating that there is um, new disease counts and spread uh, throughout the entire country. And again, as we turn now to our, Vermont, or to our regional specific data, you can really see that highlighted here where we saw a 48 percent increase in cases week over week, close to 8,000 more cases uh, this week uh, than last week. And we also, we've mentioned this in the past, but we include Quebec in this total. But even removing the Quebec numbers uh, is a 46 percent increase this week, uh, just from New England uh, and New York. So uh, definitely an increase that we're seeing. Uh, Quebec, Massachusetts, uh, and New York, particularly New York City, are accounting for a lot uh, of that increased uh, case count in our region. Again, you can look at this now visually week over week. You can see that we are uh, trending up. Uh, we look at the most recent week of 24,000 cases, up from about 16,000 last week. Um, it was a more mild increase the last few, last six or seven weeks, and you can see that this week really did jump more significantly. But to go back all the way to the beginning of the pandemic, when you see the week over week count, you can put that into a little bit of a perspective. You can see both how high it was in March and April and then how quickly the case counts went up in March and April. So this is a much more gradual increase, but nonetheless something uh, to keep a close eye on uh, in the region. Turning now to our Vermont specific data, I uh, did want to just highlight the numbers from September since there are a few things uh, to pull out here. Uh, first, we had very low case count, 132 cases. That's uh, considerably less than we had in August, July, and June. So September is a very good month. Fortunately, we didn't have a single fatality from COVID in the month of September. We didn't even have anybody in the ICU in the month of September, which is pretty remarkable as well. When we go down to the next slide, though, just something else to pull out from the data. When you look at the age breakdown of the last few months and you look at those that are 0 to 9, uh, and 10 to 19, you look at that particular grouping, uh, we actually saw a decrease in cases among that age group when schools reopened in September. Of course, they didn't open until September 8th, but there was a reduction of about 41 percent uh, since August and 58 percent since July. So even though schools K through 12 did reopen, K through 12 age children were back in school, a reduction uh, among that age group. So again, positive uh, news for our school reopening. Turning now to the weekly update, you see that we obviously did have an increase in our cases, 72 cases this week, largely driven by uh, the outbreak uh, in Addison County. Um, we still, however, uh, maintain the lowest seven-day infection rate in the country, obviously the lowest infection rate from the beginning of the pandemic, and have one of the lowest positivity rates, depending on how you calculate it, either the lowest in the country uh, or one of the lowest. So the numbers still look very strong. Um, and uh, as you'll see from our forecast, uh, in a minute, um, we still are anticipating rather low case counts throughout the month of October and into November. Just topping, talking really quickly on the restart metrics, again, uh, the four syndromic surveillance growth rate, positivity rate, and ICU capacity, they're all trending uh, favorably. The syndromic surveillance continues to be very low. Our growth rate obviously ticked up with the cases from yesterday, but nothing of concern. It's not a sustained type of growth that would be concerning. Positivity rate over the 14 days, or last seven days rather, still 0.44, uh, so a very low positivity rate overall. And then the ICU, you know, we fluctuate there, but certainly enough capacity in our hospital system uh, to take care of anyone at this point that um, is ill with COVID. Mentioning that forecast on the next slide, you'll see um, that increase in our actual cases. Obviously, that jumps up from the numbers from yesterday. But prior to that outbreak, we were relatively on track for our forecast. It's still anticipating a mild increase as we move more into October, November, accounting for increased mobility from parents, you know, 
anyone in, in, in higher education, um, just generally the society being more mobile. Uh, so that's something that we'll keep a close eye on, but nothing certainly that's concerning uh, at this time. Speaking now just high level about the Vermont uh, flu data, this is something we'll present on each week since we're getting into that period of time where it's really critical for folks to get their flu shot as the flu will start circulating um, more uh, in a more intense way in the not too distant future and we'll have some data on that that shows you know when it really hits um, the United States and and Vermont uh, but generally you know the flu will generally peak somewhere between December and February um, but it will start circulating more intensely you know anytime in October uh, and November so all the more reason uh, to really uh, focus on getting your flu shot uh, anytime you can but certainly over the next few weeks looking at the next slide it really shows the issue here you can see um, this is based on a quarterly hospital inpatient discharge for, for influenza uh, count. But you can see quite clearly that in that first quarter, that's January to March, that the number of inpatient discharges with uh, diagnosed with influenza significantly increases and puts a strain on the hospital capacity. So anything that we can do to get those numbers down so that there is more hospital availability for anyone that might need COVID treatment, um, particularly when national forecasts and you see cases in the region going up and ticking up, you want to make sure that there's enough hospital capacity to treat everyone with the flu, but also anyone with COVID as well. So getting a flu shot will really help contribute uh, to that cause. The data from the Department of Health shows uh, to date, we are ahead compared to where we were last year in terms of how many Vermonters have gotten the vaccine. We're up about 21%. Uh, so 35,949 individuals have gotten their flu shot compared to just over 29,000 last year. Uh, but we are significantly away from our goal. That obviously will get closed in the next uh, four to six weeks. But uh, we, the Department of Health has set that goal of 325,000 Vermonters vaccinated. Um, it's a 20% increase compared to last year uh, in terms of the number of people vaccinated. We're on pace to meet it. Um, but we certainly need Vermonters to go out and get their flu shot and contribute to this cause to make sure that our hospital capacity stays um, free and clear for those that need treatment uh, throughout the rest of the fall and into the winter. You can see by age on the next slide, there are certain age groups that have done um, really well compared to last year. Um, you know, the, those that are younger, under 18 years old, are up significantly, about 50% compared to last year. Those that are more middle age and older are also up compared to last year. Those that are in their young 20s into young 30s, they're down a little bit from last year. And of course, even if you might not have a significant impact from the flu, you certainly can spread the virus to others that might. So it's important really for everyone to get vaccinated. Um, so just a reminder for those that maybe aren't thinking the flu is going to impact them that significantly, it can always impact someone that you care for and love, just like uh, we've seen with COVID-19. So skipping ahead to the higher education uh, in K through 12 data, you'll see uh, Vermont stays pretty stable here with four cases. You can see New Hampshire and Maine, uh, they are experiencing significantly more cases than us, but relatively mild compared to the rest of the country. 85 cases in New Hampshire, um, 45 cases in Maine, impacting a number of schools in both of those states. The higher ed data stayed pretty stable for us here in Vermont. Approximately another 10,000 tests, uh, another four students tested positive this week, uh, bringing the total number of tests to just under 100,000 for uh, all higher ed institutions in Vermont uh, and 51 uh, people, uh, students impacted uh, with COVID-19. Finally, uh, updating on the travel map, uh, you'll see here that there are some counties in our bordering communities that have improved, others that have gone uh, the other direction. Generally, though, as you uh, saw with that regional data, with cases going up, the number of individuals allowed to come in without a quarantine has gone down uh, to 2.9 million. That is the lowest uh, number since we released the travel map, again, indicating that those increases in the region. You see that Washington County and Essex County in New York have flipped back to green, so they have had improvement there. But other counties in southern Vermont, like Rensselaer County and Franklin County, Massachusetts, flipped back to yellow. Um, so just be mindful if you live in those communities, Brattleboro or Bennington, about uh, traveling across borders. Um, and last, you know, you just see here that highlight on the last page where some places have increased, uh, some places have gotten better. The places that have increased largely in the capital region in New York uh, and then Western Massachusetts, uh, but we are seeing cases grow uh, throughout uh, the region as well. 
So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Levine. Good morning. On Monday, we saw a spike in the number of positive tests. And yesterday afternoon, at a separate briefing, Agriculture Secretary Tebitz and I reported an outbreak of COVID-19 among apple pickers at Champlain Orchards in Shoreham. We learned of the first case last week when one of the guest workers tested positive, and our EPI team quickly began to interview close contacts and provide public health guidance, and work closely with the owner of the orchards and the Vermont Agency of Agriculture to implement isolation and quarantine. Because there was a risk of spread among the farm workers, we decided to offer testing to all of them over the weekend. Of 101 people tested, 27 workers had positive results. For those of you who follow these numbers closely, you may recognize that we noted 26 yesterday. The 27th was from the same batch of labs that was sent over the weekend. It just was delayed in getting a result back. I'll also comment that for the entire state yesterday, there were four new cases, none of which were in Addison County. Contact tracing has been completed, and at this time, the outbreak is contained to the site. And as I said yesterday, I want to emphasize once again, there is no known risk to the public. There's also no risk in eating apples or any other products that were grown or produced by the orchards. And if you've been apple picking in the past couple of weeks or visited the farm stand, you're not at risk either. We thank the owner who's complying with all of our public health recommendations and for working with us to put measures in place to keep anyone who may be contagious from coming into contact with other workers at the orchards. The orchard owners and state agencies are working to make sure these workers have what they need, food, shelter, and other things to quarantine and isolate safely. Now, in light of the most recent national events, I hardly need remind Vermonters of the nature of the virus. It spreads quickly and easily, especially among groups of people who, by necessity, like our guest laborers live close together. People do not get sick because they are from a certain place or they are of a certain ethnicity or nationality. They get sick if they are exposed to the virus. But the virus spreads just as well among those who you would expect to be the most protected but who don't take basic precautions, wearing a mask, keeping a distance, avoiding crowds. Testing is detection, it is not prevention. It's vital that Vermonters know the facts about COVID, learn from trusted sources who will tell you the truth even as we learn more about the virus. Do not be distracted or swayed by so much chaos and political theater at the top. COVID-19 spreads because it is a highly contagious virus that is in the air we all breathe. As the weather turns and we spend more time inside together, taking COVID safety precautions is more important than ever. I'd like to now comment on another mechanism for spread. In the past few weeks, it was reported that the CDC had put up and quickly taken down a statement on its website referring to so-called airborne transmission of COVID-19. Well, as of yesterday, it was up again. I've mentioned this phenomenon a number of times, and I wanted just to recap it at this time. Airborne transmission, sometimes called aerosolization, is not novel. It's an important way that infections like tuberculosis, measles, and chickenpox are spread. As opposed to the large respiratory droplets we commonly say are the major mode of transmission of COVID-19, airborne transmission means infections spread by exposure 
to the small droplets and particles that can linger in the air for minutes or sometimes hours. To get infected this way, you can be further than six feet away from the infected person and even get infected when the person no longer is in the room. This form of transmission has been thought to occur within enclosed spaces that did not have adequate ventilation where the infected person was breathing heavily. For example, in the literature, there are reports of singing or exercising, like in a choir practice or an aerobic class in a closed studio without windows. Now, nothing I've said should change the way you try to prevent yourself from contracting COVID-19, because large droplet transmission is still the number one way and the major way you could get the virus. So the six foot spacing and the masking are still terribly important. What also becomes important, especially in winter, is avoiding crowded and or poorly ventilated spaces as good ventilation reduces exposure to all particles of any size and at all distances. And avoiding crowded spaces, of course, minimizes the type of close contact that is primarily responsible for the spread of this virus. I'll turn it back to the governor now. Thank you, Commissioner Levine. We'll now open up for, uh, for questions. Calvin. Uh, thank you, Governor. So, um, yeah, I could be pro-class your, your veto on Act 250 bill. I'm wondering if you can explain the reason. I know along the way that concerns wonder if you can explain your reasoning that maybe the executive order that, that came out along with it we went into this uh, a couple of years ago um, working with environmental groups um, with legislators uh, in the administration to try and find common ground uh, for act 250 uh, improvements uh, modernization it's 50 years old um, so it was time um, we've heard a lot of complaints about Act 250 and the process and so forth. Um, so we found uh, a lot of those uh, areas of, of common interest and uh, went forward with that, um, moved through the House and with many of those intact. Um, but when it came through the Senate, uh, and I, you know, in defense of, of, the, uh, of the Senate uh, and, uh, and the legislature in general, COVID has changed uh, a lot of aspects. Um, there's not as much interaction. Uh, it's all remotely uh, done. And, um, and I'm, when, when the bill was finalized, it really only had one or two components. One um, being uh, forest fragmentation. This is a big policy uh, initiative, uh, probably the largest in 50 years. This adds uh, to some of the burden, uh, although there are benefits as well. The other uh, initiative that was important to me uh, from the very beginning uh, was a permanent solution to recreation trails for review uh, under Act 250, an exemption uh, to that. Um, what ended up happening uh, was a, about a 14-month delay uh, there wasn't a permanent solution, and, um, and all we really got in the end, uh, everything else that we had worked on together was not included, and there was just forced fragmentation and a Band-Aid uh, for maybe one, uh, one particular uh, recreation association, uh, trail or, or, uh, association, uh, that would have been beneficial. And, uh, and then, again, it was just 14 months, so it wasn't a permanent solution. So. Uh, in the end, I thought it was better uh, to just start again in January and uh, and bring some of those other areas of common interest back into the fold and, and get back to work. And um, lawmakers I spoke with, they say that uh, the issues come January will still be on the table. I'm just wondering if the administration will have the appetite to tackle Act 250 reform in January, uh, especially seeing as how we, we don't know, you know, whether it will be at the State House or whether it will be at Zoom. I'm just wondering, I guess, uh, what, where, if, the, if the political will is there. Uh, from my standpoint, if I'm still in office, I can guarantee our administration uh, will be at the table uh, trying to move forward in a good faith effort uh, for Act 250 improvements, modernization, 
and uh, trying to work together uh, to resolve some of those issues and get a, f a much broader uh, perspective, much better package uh, passed. And then I just have one last question for Dr. Levine about the outbreak in Addison County. Um, in, among the migrant farm worker communities, I'm just wondering what sort of outreach that the Department of Health, uh, if any, is, is doing for you know, either this specific incident or, or maybe others as well. Uh, when you say outreach, exactly what are you referring to? Well, out outreach as in like education and trying to be like uh, ed educating um, many of the people that were on the pizza program with sort of what this entails and, and how to deal with the virus. Yeah, good, good question. So obviously our team both from health and agriculture were on site over the weekend, um, providing plenty of education to all of the workers, not just the ones who uh, turned COVID positive, um, and providing a lot of advice regarding the isolation and quarantine procedure and how to cohort people so that those who did not have a positive test would not be at risk, hopefully, of uh, getting a positive test. Uh, making sure that the communities that are all together there are not um, intersecting in ways that would allow virus to spread from one to another. Um, we're very fortunate. Uh, th these workers um, have been often coming here for years. So I think they uh, are almost part of the community that they're in. They have a great deal of trust and faith in those they work with and work for. Uh, which I think is always a positive sign as well. And there's a lot of activity um, surrounding um, should there be need for health care uh, and providing the appropriate connections that will be needed. Ross? Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Levine, sorry I should have grabbed you before you stepped away. Um, just a quick point of clarification. Is that one new case now of the 27? Are all 27? Uh, Migrant farmers, members of that community? Yes. And it's from the same group um, that were brought here together uh, as, a, as a large group uh, in the middle of um, September. Understood. Thank you. And Governor, you mentioned uh, last week that you'd be mulling over uh, S54 for cannabis this weekend. Curious of uh, what that reflect for production brought out and if there's any update you can give us on maybe where you're leaning towards making a decision. Well, I obviously I have until tomorrow um, to uh, come to a conclusion on that and uh, still weighing all the options and uh, moving in that direction again. Uh, weighing what they've done uh, again in good faith, uh, they did uh, move forward uh, in a lot of areas that I had concerns about. It still isn't exactly what I'd like to see, uh, and there are some shortcomings. Um, so, again, uh, I'll be reflecting on that over the next uh, 24 hours and then coming to a conclusion tomorrow. Thank you. Steve? Governor, with the executive order, can you give us just a little bit of a, an executive summary, if you will, of what you have you know, in the Act 250 uh, legislation, you provided an executive order to kind of bridge the gap until the legislative session? Yeah, this, <clears throat> the executive order uh, will uh, basically take the place of what was in the, the, uh, the legislation uh, for help of uh, this so-called Band-Aid over the next few months uh, for the trails, uh, trail associations and uh, address their concerns. So uh, we feel the executive order will supplement that uh, until we can come to a more permanent solution with legislation uh, in January, hopefully. And um, on the uh, political side, uh, are you uh, planning any sort of uh, uh, public, uh, public events or anything like that uh, as far as the campaign goes? Um, nothing at this point, no. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Governor, uh, first, maybe just a quick update. Uh, State Police again denied information about a couple of public traffic tickets issued to uh, some reckless teen drivers on Vermont highways, which obviously we're seeing a large increase in highway deaths this year. And the denial was apparently based uh, by legal counsel Rosemary Gurekowski 
It conflicts with the ruling your former public safety commissioner, Tom Anderson, a former U.S. attorney, had issued. I'm just wondering when the public can expect getting back to a little more transparent Vermont and hold it Vermont drivers accountable yeah. for their actions on public highways. Yeah, thank you, Micah, and uh, and I'm not up to speed at this point uh, as to where we are in the process. Um, we've had a lot going on, obviously, over the last uh, month or so, uh, but uh, possibly Commissioner Sherling uh, could bring us up to up to date. But I mean, your own commissioner, Tom Anderson, at one point, I mean, well-respected uh, former U.S. attorney in Vermont. Given your office a legal opinion and the state police a legal opinion that says traffic tickets are public record. And yeah. I, again, people wonder. I, 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 I can only, um, if Tommy Anderson was here today uh, as commissioner, I believe he would have come to the same conclusion after someone brought this fact up and would have wanted um, more research done in order to make sure that we. Uh, present uh, in fairness uh, to those uh, involved in any instance like this uh, their opportunities so we want to make sure we're on solid ground uh, we have every intent in, in going back to the way we were if uh, if that's legal to do so um, but uh, but again to take this time I think is important uh, to make sure that we're on solid legal footing Those apples, from my understanding, are disinfected um, before being released to the public. But uh, I'll let uh, Dr. Levine answer that. Yeah, the governor was correct with that. In addition, uh, when you review the uh, now the world's literature on transmission of COVID, uh, there are really no evidence that transmission can occur by food, uh, by eating food. With regard to your previous question, um, as to our knowledge, this is the last group of uh, workers that have arrived and will arrive this season. Doesn't mean that all the rest are going home. Uh, many stay for, for other activities that they're employed for uh, over the course of the next couple of months. Um, so this is really uh, the first outbreak we've had uh, in the group of uh, guest workers. So. Um, We'll learn from this experience, obviously, but uh, there's nothing to translate into the other groups because no one else will be arriving. Just to, just to clarify, I did not only mean people eating the food, but oftentimes, much like in the grocery stores, people pick up fruit to try to check the firmness and other things. So that that is, I think, some of the concern that people could touch that yeah. maybe no. some of these people may have, have done, not just eating the apples, but touching them. Un understood. And we, we don't have the impression that will be a concern at this orchard at this time. Okay, great. Um, Any other orchards? I believe uh, all orchards would be included under that. Yeah. All right, we're going to go to Wilson at the AP. Um, hi, everybody. More on the, uh, uh, the orchard. I'm curious, the first case that popped up last week, if they arrived on the 4th of, I don't know, mid-September, was it the 14th? That was more than 14 days ago. Do you think that person picked up, uh, assuming it's a him, picked up his infection here, or did he bring it with him? And I see there's, um, I heard a report that one of the apple pickers is 
uh, hospitalized. Is that true? And then finally, with these uh, 26 or 27 apple pickers, I don't know Secretary Tepp, is this neighbor to bring in the apple crop? Um, Those are my questions. Okay, I think your third question, uh, I think we got most of that. Um, and we'll probably ask uh, Secretary Tebbets or Deputy Secretary Eastman to address that, but uh, Dr. Levine can take the first two. Okay, thank you. So you're correct. This group came to the country in mid-September, and it was at the very tail end of the quarantine period that the index case became symptomatic. So we don't believe this was acquired uh, within Vermont. It, it came with the person. Um, you, you also should realize Addison County has had uh, very low numbers of cases um, historically during this pandemic. Uh, your other question is, uh, yes, I can attest to the fact that there is one individual who was hospitalized. I'm not absolutely certain they're still hospitalized, but I know they were initially hospitalized. Thank you on that. And we'll go to the uh, to the phone, uh, either Deputy Secretary Eastman or Secretary Tevitz. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Governor. Deputy Secretary Eastman. Um, if I understood the question correctly, it was, um, is the crop at risk of being harvested? And the answer to that question is no. So if I misunderstood the question, please correct me. No, that, that, that was my correction. But the question is exactly, were there enough people to pick the apple? And if there are, yeah. that answers my question. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yep, thank you all. Kat, WCAX. Hi. A question for a viewer who wanted to know what's going to happen to all the Vermont pop-up testing sites that are currently held outside when the weather turns colder in the winter? Um, we've already uh, made some arrangements and brought some of them inside anticipating the cool weather that will, will arrive uh, or has arrived already. Um, but uh, I'll let uh, Secretary Smith answer that more directly or Commissioner Levine. Or both. <laughs> <laughs> the governor is absolutely correct. We're going to start bringing those um, uh, facilities inside. For example, the um, the state office building in Rutland. There's a there's a very very big lobby. Uh, we're going to bring um, we're going to have testing inside that state office building, as well as other locations uh, throughout the state where we have district offices uh, throughout the state. So uh, that's the plan uh, right now. Did I get everything? Uh, that's the plan, Cap. Okay. Follow up question then that I had to that, which was. Are these sites going to be continuing in the same frequency as they have had during the summer, which was kind of a higher travel peak time? We're going to we're going to have the same frequency, I believe, in terms of the testing sites. So you shouldn't see a change uh, too much uh, at all in terms of testing sites and uh, and frequency. There may be a little bit of change. I mean. For example, in Essex, we have some spots that we may not be able to use in uh, in the wintertime. But I think you'll see that we won't ramp down our testing capabilities at all. The site in Essex, is that like the fairground site? What, what sites are those? Well, there's Alliance Church, for example. Tomorrow, I'll give a plug. Tomorrow, um, there is a pop-up site at the uh, Alliance Church in Essex on Old Stage Road. And last question, are these sites going to test for flu as we head into flu season as well? So when, when someone gets a COVID test, are they also going to get a flu test? Probably uh, not. I'll let Dr. Levine talk about uh, where flu vaccinations are, the, are best um, achieved. Uh, probably not at the COVID sites. Uh, not vaccination, flu test. So like if somebody presents with symptoms and they're going to one of these pop-up sites, are they going to be tested for flu as well? Yeah, so, you know, our preference is that these pop-up sites are generally not used for symptomatic folk, that they're connect, they connect with the healthcare system and get directed appropriately for a testing site. But 
Having said that, we know that there are times that symptomatic people do show up, um, and we certainly uh, try to make accommodations for that uh, and keep them segregated from uh, people who are there because they're asymptomatic. So because of the lack of focus on symptomatic people, I don't think that testing for flu will come up much uh, at the pop-ups themselves, but it will come up consistently through those winter months when people present with respiratory symptoms. Um, and we're awaiting the uh, hopeful arrival of a test that actually can use one specimen and test for both uh, diseases concurrently. But even if that were not available, um, there are still the traditional flu swab tests that we could use uh, and that clinicians would use for symptomatic people. Okay. Thank you. Andrew, Caledonia Record. Can I, before oh, Andrew, um, before you uh, ask the question, I just want to make it clear. Um, our goal is to continue to test over a thousand people a day. Uh, that's something that we put into place uh, in the summer and we'll continue to do that. But the, in anticipation of the colder weather, uh, we've tried to reach out to our, uh, our partners, uh, some of the FQHCs, uh, as well as uh, as the private pharmacies and so forth uh, to build out our capacity. So that's exactly why we're doing that. So we'll continue to seek out other uh, uh, locations and uh, other partners uh, to make sure that we continue with this testing because it's so essential uh, as we try and you know contemplate what's happening in Vermont. Okay, Andrew, Caledonia Record. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is for Dr. Levine. Uh, I see the kingdom is the only region of the state that hasn't had any new cases in the last two weeks. Um, in fact, it's been since September 11th for Caledonia County, September 10th for Orleans, and August 7th for Essex County. Uh, can you draw any conclusions uh, about the prevalence of the virus in the kingdom given that? And uh, with the talk about testing here just barely, is the kingdom keeping pace with testing to know if that's an accurate reflection of the, of the virus situation here? Your, the early part of what you were saying was that there were no cases? Is that what you'd said? Yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah. Only region of the state that's coming up with zero cases on the, on the health site data for the last two weeks. Um, and it's been actually much longer than that. Yeah, and it does have a lower rate uh, over the course of the pandemic as well. Um, so, you know, what we've been telling people, because it is true when you look at the national experience, is rurality, being more rural, is not necessarily protective when it comes to COVID. And most of the surge activity that occurred in the South and the West uh, was not huge metropolitan areas uh, in, the, in the summertime, it was actually suburban and rural areas. Um, and what we're seeing happening now in the Midwest uh, is somewhat mirroring that as well. Um, so I'd like to say that it's so rural in the parts of the state you're talking about that that's why the counts are low, but that really isn't backed up by the, the national data anyways. Um, how about if I tell you that uh, they are the most compliant part of the state with regard to adherence to all of the things the governor and I say every week? Um, Do you have any data to support that? I don't have any data to support that at all. Uh, so, um, again, um, you know, certainly we know that during the course of the summer and fall, um, we have plenty of visitors to those portions of the state. Um, the, the leaf peeping uh, is, is no better, no worse than anywhere else. So, um, and there's often lots of other uh, sports that people are going up there for. So I don't really have a great explanation for you, um, except you know we could just come up with a list of theories. All right, well, I'll chalk it up to uh, Commissioner Levine to speculate. We're doing a better job than everyone else. <laughs> Thank you. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Good morning. I believe this question is for Commissioner Smith. 
some of the schools, including ours, are contemplating a return to five days a week. And we're curious what will happen to the many child care that have been stood up throughout mm -hmm. the state. Will they continue to receive support from the state? Will those workers be kept employed in preparation or in case of a surge later in the winter? Secretary Smith. Thanks, Lisa. As you um, know, we, um, on these child care hubs, what we do pay for is sort of the startup cost of these, of these hubs. Uh, we, we try to make sure that the startup costs are taken care of so that the focus can be on the operational costs and obviously the operational costs are between those who run it and the parents who bring them. We're trying to remain as flexible as possible. Um, I think uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, Vermont After School that talked about this, that trying to remain as flexible as possible in case there is a surge or in case there is something that happens um, where we have to return in, the, in a specific uh, vicinity uh, to uh, less than five days a week. So we're trying to stay flexible right now. Um, we have enough funding until the end of December uh, to, to, do, to remain that flexible, so we'll just see how it goes. I, I don't have a specific answer for you right now. Um, we're just trying to remain as flexible as possible. Does that flexibility include somehow keeping the staff on payroll? We'll, we'll have to see. Um, obviously, uh, they, we don't have that situation now. Um, we could move uh, that staff to other hubs uh, that, may be, uh, that may need staff. Um, we'll, we'll just have to see. I, I can't give you a specific answer right now. Thank you. Guy Page. Good morning, Governor. Some Republicans in Grand Isle County have run an ad in the island with a local newspaper saying that under the Global Warming Solutions Act, the 23-person Climate Council could impose carbon pricing at the gas pump without legislation. Do you share that concern? Well, as you know, Guy, I had my concerns with the Global Warming Solutions Act. That's why I uh, vetoed it from a constitutional standpoint. I still have those uh, very same concerns. Um, a 23-person council uh, that is unaccountable in some respects uh, can impose almost anything uh, from our perspective. But uh, again, I don't know about the particulars. I haven't seen the ad, um, but, um, but I have my concerns about it. That's why I vetoed it. In respect to uh, some sort of carbon pricing, I mean, not, I'm not holding you accountable for what's in the ad, but do you think that carbon pricing is something that could be imposed by this council? Well, again, I think uh, they have a lot of latitude. Uh, the, the legislature um, abdicated their power and gave it to this 23-person council um, so they could do almost anything. Okay, thank you. Um, Nationwide, uh, there's been a growing number of police officer retirements since June, a lot of it having to do stemming from the uh, George Floyd situation. Uh, have you been evaluating the rate of police officer retirement in Vermont? And if, if, is there any? Is there a greater rate than, than usual? I'm going to refer that question to Commissioner Shirley. Good morning. Thanks for the question. Uh, we have uh, begun to sort of scan the landscape to see the impact uh, of current events, but at this point it's too early to tell uh, whether they're having a, an impact on retention and attrition. Thank you. Eric, the Times Argus. Yes, uh, the president appears to be recovering from his bout with the virus, but he has since sent out tweets talking about how uh, COVID is nothing to be afraid of, don't let it dominate your life. Uh, a, a tweet that has since been flagged by Twitter talks about how uh, 
the flu sometimes kills over 100,000 people. We don't close down the country for that. We just have to learn to live with it like we do with COVID. Does all of this undermine your efforts to try to get a hold of the virus? Um, thank you, Erica. I continue uh, to be concerned about the president's lack of leadership, particular, particularly in this area um, of uh, mask wearing, uh, which has been scientifically proven uh, to prevent the spread of this deadly disease. Uh, it's, some, it's one of the reasons we've been so successful here in Vermont, not the only reason, um, but uh, we've been compliant. Uh, we've, uh, we've taken those uh, prevention um, guidelines uh, to heart, and the Vermonters have done the right thing. And, uh, and I think that uh, until there's a vaccine uh, that is safe to distribute, uh, it's really the only thing we have uh, to fight this. Um, so I'm very extremely proud of Vermont for the way uh, they've handled this, Vermonters. But, uh, but I'm concerned uh, about this um, division uh, that we're seeing, this political division uh, due to this mass policy in particular and uh, how dangerous that really is because wearing a mask is uh, altruistic uh, and it's, uh, it's something that I believe is necessary uh, to prevent the spread. Do you have any concerns about potentially having any outbreaks here because people have decided to listen to what the president is saying compared to what you or the doctor are saying? I am concerned uh, about the spread every single day. Um, you know, I wake up uh, and, uh, and I read the reports and wait with beta breath as to what I'm going to find. Um, so uh, it's a concern that I think we all share. Uh, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, because of what's surrounding us. Uh, we, we identified this early on. I, you know, there was a lot of frustration uh, from many uh, in the state uh, because our, our low rate of uh, transmission, uh, low case counts here in Vermont, uh, and people couldn't understand why we were continuing uh, to uh, close down businesses and, and so forth and, and put these restrictions into place. Um, but it was because of what we're seeing around us. We're seeing it today. Mr. Pichek uh, showed it on the map. Um, there's, you know, continuing case uh, increases uh, in this region, uh, in Canada and Quebec, uh, but also uh, in the New England and Northeast with uh, New York. So I continue uh, to be concerned uh, because, uh, again, we're part of this, this region. We're not here on an island. And we've seen what's happened to other states who have let their guard down, I believe. I mean, you look at Wyoming, Montana, Hawaii, and so forth, and uh, their, their rates have climbed significantly uh, since they were uh, the, the lowest on the list at one point in time. Uh, and now uh, we enjoy that position, and I, um, I hope that Vermonters uh, will stay vigilant uh, because it's really uh, beneficial uh, to not just themselves, but their their parents and grandparents and, and their friends and neighbors. I mean, this is, this is something that we can prevent. As I said before, this is literally in our hands. Uh, and if we uh, do the right things, we follow the guidelines and uh, continue to take those simple steps, uh, we won't have anything to worry about. But, but we have to, uh, again, rely on our neighbors to do the same thing. So again, I'm concerned uh, about the president's position on this. and. As I said, the lack of leadership. Thank you, Governor. Greg, the County Courier. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, just a quick follow-up on Eric's question. Uh, you mentioned that masks have been either the, the success for Vermont. Uh, do you wish that you would uh, impose the mask mandate sooner in the pandemic? Um, no, um, and why I say that is because we we were watching uh, the data, we were watching the science, and again, uh, we were doing all the right things, so a lot of uh, uh, compliance uh, that without the mandate. And, uh, but then we saw, as you might recall, what was happening on the East Coast. There was a, a rebound uh, in the number of cases coming right up the East Coast, affecting Virginia, then Ohio, uh, and then uh, Maryland, and it was coming our way. And so, to, um, to prevent, uh, to try and provide another line of defense, 
we thought it was necessary at that point, uh, and we gave them enough flexibility, enough time uh, to implement. But, uh, but I don't believe we had low case numbers before, but we've been able to maintain that, even seeing others throughout the country uh, with huge outbreaks and uh, increased case counts. Um, so we, uh, we, have, uh, we have been able to, to avoid that, uh, but, uh, but I think we put the mass policy in place at the exact right time. Thanks for that clarification. Um, moving on, I'm, I'm wondering what sort of oversight the state has, uh, either oversight or enforcement the state has on your travel policy for federal employees. Um, I'm told that there's a number of employees from USCIS and TSA out of Burlington um, that have traveled, whether it be for personal or business reasons, uh, during this pandemic, and, and some of them very recently, uh, and when they return to work, they are, or when they return to Vermont, they're told, you will return to work. The pandemic is not a reason to stay home for a week or two or however long they need to. Um, I, I'm wondering what sort of oversight or enforcement the state has on that uh, sort of issue. Well, again, I would uh, I would assume that they're being classified as essential employees, and uh, so there is um, there's some latitude provided uh, for those essential employees. And um, as I've said numerous times, our travel policy, our quarantine policy, is not perfect. Um, we're hoping uh, that most will will adhere to it uh, because we think it's helpful uh, in what we've done thus far and what we need to do in the future. So. Uh, again, uh, admittedly, uh, it's not perfect, and uh, we don't have control over every sector. Uh, but, um, but by and large, I think people are following the policy. So are essential employees exempt from the travel policy? Uh, I believe some are exempt, um, but um, I don't know if Secretary Curley is on the line uh, to give us a further explanation of, of that exemption. but. But I believe some are exempt. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm here. Uh, so, if employees, if people are traveling for work-related purposes, then they would be exempt. But if they're traveling for personal reasons and coming back and not quarantining or you know having a part of a quarantine and a test, a negative test, then they would be in violation of the state cross-state uh, travel policy. Employers do have the ability to um, deny a leave request if, if an employee is planning to go to a county that is not qualifying for a quarantine-free travel. So um, you know, we have continued to ask people to be very diligent and to only travel if they absolutely cannot do that work remotely. Um, and even if they are traveling for work purposes, which is exempt, we're asking folks to be very thoughtful and cautious about what they're doing while they're they're traveling to, to other areas and coming back. Okay, and uh, quick follow-up to that, and uh, I'll let you go because I, I know there's many other people waiting. Uh, the state of Vermont has had a, a travel ban for state employees. Uh, with the current events, whether it be civil unrest or the wildfires, are we sending any Vermont employees out of state? And uh, I guess what's the policy when they come back if, if they do travel? Uh, I'm not aware of any we've sent. Uh, we uh, are, are always open to any requests uh, to assist our, our neighbors and other states. Uh, but I'm not aware of any that we have uh, followed up on or we have been able to commit to. Thank you, Governor. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Aaron, VT Digger. Okay. Looking at the uh, data announced on the Department of Health page today, I noticed that there are some um, discrepancies in how the data is reported compared to yesterday. Like the, um, the cases were moved the new cases were moved from Monday when they were first reported to Sunday. 
Um, and the number of total tests performed statewide actually fell compared to yesterday um, based on the, the, you know, screenshots I've saved and, um, you know, tracking that other people have done. This isn't the first time that I've noticed the data kind of retroactively changing, but it's not laundered or noted anywhere in the system, so it can be kind of difficult to understand uh, when the data has changed and why. Um, have you considered introducing some sort of transparency to that? You mean, um, uh, and do you know specifically, uh, if, if you happen to know specifically why the data changed in this particular case, that would be helpful. Yeah, I, I'm not this aware. This is for Dr. Levine. Right, I'm not aware of, of why the information changes in terms of transparency. Um, we provide that information to the best of our ability on a daily basis in its public facing, so I, th I think that's fairly transparent. I think what you're getting at is maybe an explanation as to why it might have changed in a footnote of some sort. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, um, it really, it, it relies on people uh, like me to who are watching the data constantly to see, you know, these kind of changes. And I still, you know, have to contact the Department of Health if I want an explanation um, as to what, what the changes are, or even if I'm trying to calculate how many tests there have been in a day, um, I, I don't necessarily know that. Commissioner Levine. So most of the data is pretty much real-time data, so there are times that when our data team looks at the data uh, or gets new information in, um, they either change the day, they may have to actually reconcile the data with other data, there may be a duplication of cases that they weren't aware of because there are so many tests being done um, and they have to make sure that one positive is reported once and not more than one time. I'm not sure about the changes you just referred to uh, in the last day. I'd have to look into that with the data team. It's not unusual for us in our evening reports to find out that um, a case that had been reported a previous day was either removed or moved to a different date, or, or sometimes a case was added, um, because this is all happening real time, and people are analyzing this pretty much around the clock. Um, obviously, we'll have to connect with you to get to the actual specifics of the changes that you just observed in the last day, because I'm not aware of uh, the rationale behind them. But clearly, you mentioned the word transparency, and that's what we're being, is very transparent by making sure that we have as much uh, accurate information up to date as possible. Yeah, um, one of the reasons I ask about this is um, one of the previous times the test numbers have dropped. Uh, when I asked about it, it turned out that antibody tests had been included in the data and were taken yep. out. So just to clarify, antibody tests are still not included in this data, correct? That's correct. Yeah, that was uh, a number of months ago and that has not uh, changed in any way since then. Okay. And antigen tests are also not included in this. It's only PCR tests. That's right. Okay. Well, thank you. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Hello. Um, I've been seeing the leaves falling and that suggests that something else may start falling soon. And I'm curious as to whether um, any progress has been made in putting together rules to uh, make sure that the ski season can um, be held safely and um, that ski areas and other hospitality connected with that can uh, go forward on some basis. Yeah, Joe, that's our that's our goal, obviously, uh, to allow for ski season uh, to continue with hospitality following suit in as safe a manner as possible. Uh, we have a team working on just that right now. Uh, we're uh, continuing to work uh, with our partners 
uh, to provide for something that uh, utilizes common sense, um, but then again provides for the safety of those uh, involved. So um, we're still, again, we're, we're probably uh, two or three weeks away uh, from providing that guidance, but uh, but we know it's almost here. Um, and, and speaking of two to three weeks away, I was wondering whether uh, there's any progress been made in uh, putting together guidance for adult care centers. I believe we talked about that on Tuesday. Yeah. Secretary Smith. Joe, thanks for the follow-up. This is uh, Mike Smith. Um, we did uh, release uh, adult day, as I, as I was pretty sure, we did release adult day reopening guidance effective 9-28-20. Um, the most vulnerable of the uh, participants might not be coming back immediately as they would present a too, uh, too big of a risk in, in this guidance. Also, we'll continue some form of telehealth as uh, we reopen physically. Each program um, within the guidance needs to create their own reopening plan, addressing their own facility and programs. Those need to be submitted to Dale uh, for review. And just to give you a sense of the guidance itself, it talks about physical space, water, climate control, number of participants uh, per square foot, face coverings, where and how to use them, how to handle drop-off and pickups of participants, daily health screenings, uh, cleaning and disinfection, um, uh, the strategies for physical distancing in a congregate setting, and how to handle uh, personal care, care for participants, food preparation and service, transportation, and we uh, make notes of all available resources. We have um, posted these uh, guidance. Um, you know, this is gonna be a tricky opening because this is, um, you know, some of these uh, individuals are vulnerable and we just gotta make sure that we do it right as we reopen the adult day centers, but the guidance is out, Joe. Thank you very much. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Kind of following up on those uh, questions, Joe. Um, given the efficacy of treatments now and um, the Vermont's low positivity rates on the one hand, on the other hand, the increasing cases in the region and across the country, are you more or less confident now uh, to uh, open up the economy more in terms of another yeah, I'm, I'm still concerned. Uh, obviously, rely on that uh, data and the science and those numbers that are provided to us on a weekly basis about the uh, mobility uh, issues uh, revolving around the transmission we're seeing in the country and the increases. Um, we rely on traffic uh, from, from our neighbors, whether it be from New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and so forth. Um, so um, when their numbers start to go up, um, it, uh, it does give me pause. And uh, so we want to do this in a safe manner. Uh, we've seen the numbers go up and down. We're hopeful. Uh, I know the other governors uh, in those states are doing all they can to prevent the rise. So we'll hopefully see those numbers retreat uh, in, uh, very soon. And then we can open up the, again, try and open up the economy in a safe manner. But if you follow the travel guidance, uh, you should be fine. Uh, and uh, again, we welcome anyone from those counties that have those low positivity rates. And as far as the nursing homes are concerned, uh, a little bit different from the um, adult uh, care home uh, situation. Uh, obviously, as, as you well know, there's a lot of concern about families and residents. Uh, there's been obviously the mental health and physical health um, impairment, I think, pretty fair to say. For the, residents having been, um, you know, in the nursing home for so long and not being able to get out. Is, is there any um, movement toward relaxing that, again, giving the efficacy of the treatment and the low positivity rate here in Vermont? Yeah, we have, uh, uh, yeah. We, we actually have, and uh, I think Secretary Smith has talked about this, but I'll bring him up to talk about it again.
Tim, we had set up a uh, sort of a three-phase, move through th three-phase proposal to open up uh, the, um, those uh, long-term care facilities, uh, skilled nursing facilities for vis visitation, including indoor um, visitation when you get to the third phase. We have revised those, um, those guidelines based upon uh, some C CMS guidance around visitation, CMS is Center for Medicaid and Medicare uh, Service, around their, uh, some of their guidance around visitation. And we're just about ready to release the, those guidance, um, which will allow indoor, um, indoor visitation on a more regular basis, based upon sort of the way that we do it here, based upon the county infection rate and um, and also sort of testing ability and, and testing in order to make sure if there's any sort of COVID positive uh, cases in there. So um, Vermont in, in every county in the whole state is under sort of their threshold for that. So we're gonna be moving to new guidance that will allow some indoor visitation along with rigorous testing uh, in for um, for staff in those nursing homes, and then if there is a positive for the in, entire uh, skilled nursing facility uh, in Vermont. So stay tuned on those guidelines getting ready to be released very very shortly. So uh, so very shortly within a, a week, Mike, or yeah, I, I I would say within days. Okay. All right. Great. Well, everyone will appreciate that. Thank you. Yep. Stewart, NBC5. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, going back to the college reopening data for a second, um, Burlington has decided to relax its earlier curfew uh, for city bars and restaurants. I'm wondering, uh, for Dr. Levine, I guess, uh, have any problem with that? Seem an appropriate move given the data or what? I'm going to let Dr. Levine answer from his perspective. I would just add that we gave flexibility uh, to communities to make these decisions on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, knowing their communities and when they felt safe uh, or uh, they felt as though uh, they need to impose uh, some of these uh, restrictions on their communities. So um, we've, we've done that. Uh, obviously, the uh, city of Burlington feels as though uh, it's time to open those up, and that's their prerogative uh, at this point. Dr. Levine. Yes, I have to say that both in Burlington and statewide, the college data does look still quite good. And we're not seeing instances of transmission of COVID uh, within the campus setting. Um, and uh, the numbers have certainly been low enough that um, if the city of Burlington or any other city who had a similar ordinance in place decided to re relax the uh, time of closing of bars, for instance, uh, one couldn't argue with that. You know, I think everyone realizes that um, economically that's a hardship for a, a bunch of owners and um, if it can't be justified from a public health standpoint, you know, I think, that, again, you watch the data closely. So watching the data to this point, uh, I can't believe that the hour of closing bars is the entire explanation for success in the college population. So now if that is relaxed a little, uh, again, watch the data closely. And if uh, things continue on fine, that's great, and if they don't, make appropriate adjustments. Thank you. Peter Hirschfeld, VPR. Commissioner Harrington, uh, we received a note from a listener expressing concern and confusion over the cessation of the uh, extended high unemployment benefits. I'm hoping you can explain um, how many people are going to be affected by this, uh, whether it's a certain profile of worker that's going to be affected, um, and what that impact is going to be. Additionally, 
um, the release from your department said that the uh, state is being compelled to do this because the unemployment rate dropped to 4.8 percent in, in uh, August. But I recall the governor saying quite recently that there were still 30,000 unemployed Vermonters in the state, uh, which would mean a much higher uh, unemployment rate than 4.8 percent. So I'm hoping you can help me reconcile those figures as well. Sure, happy to um, hopefully shed some light on this. So to the first part of your question about who would be impacted, um, at the time we received the notice that we would be triggering off of high extended benefits, um, there was actually no one within the program at the time. That being said, we received notice and of a future date when those benefits would be um, expiring, uh, and that is uh, the ending of this week. Uh, and I believe there are a couple people who have received benefits for, or will be receiving benefit, high extended uh, benefits for this week. I think the, the part that isn't, um, isn't quite known just yet is what the future impact would be. So this essentially um, impacts those individuals that are receiving traditional unemployment. Uh, an individual receives 26 weeks of traditional unemployment they then receive 13 weeks of pandemic emergency unemployment mm -hmm. compensation, uh, which was part of the CARES Act. And then once they've exhausted uh, 13 weeks of PEUC, um, they move on to the extended benefits program. And the extended benefits program um, under high unemployment goes to 20 weeks. Under normal extended benefits, that's another 13 week program. So there's an additional seven weeks added on to the extended benefits program when a state's unemployment rate goes to a certain level. So, um, you know, the immediate impact may be slight, but the long-term impact is essentially anybody who is filing on the traditional unemployment path who is moving through these various programs will eventually see, um, in this case, an immediate reduction of seven weeks in their um, long-term unemployment plan. Uh, and then, I, you know, it is likely at some point our rate, our unemployment rate will drop to a level that triggers us off of extended benefits altogether. Um, we did uh, provide a letter uh, of this concern and possible solutions to our congressional delegation. Um, we've also provided that to the uh, General Assembly here in the state. Um, of our concerns, uh, and I did just receive word yesterday that our congressional, dele our U.S. congressional delegation, um, did uh, has sent a letter to um, the secretary for the U.S. Department of Labor, Secretary Scalia. So um, it is something we are monitoring very closely, uh, and as people move through the weekly filing process, they will be impacted at some point in time depending on how long they have been filing for. Um, to your other question, though, about the unemployment rate and, and the impact there, all of this is based on uh, what's called the household survey, uh, which is conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, and that information um, is collected. It asks two critical questions. One, are you actively looking for work, or have you looked for work in the past four weeks? And if offered work, are you able to accept work? And it's those two critical questions that determine uh, what a state's unemployment rate uh, will be. And what we have known and have shown is that uh, COVID is a very unique situation for many when it comes to eligibility. Um, whether it's the governor or the legislature, we've all looked at different ways to support uh, individuals who are going through uh, the pandemic uh, and have provided opportunities uh, for them to stay home with loved ones, to quarantine when they are sick, um, to remove the work search requirement when we knew that um, the number of unemployed Vermonters far exceeded the number of jobs in the market. But all of those things um, have a, a, a downstream effect on whether someone is actively looking for work and or able to accept work. And so what unfortunately this does is provide um, a situation where what is actually being 
reported, collected, and calculated by the U.S. Census Bureau and the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics and then reported by the state is a number that I, I don't believe and, and many of us uh, don't believe is truly reflective of the current condition in the state. So we're reporting an unemployment rate of 4.8% um, and for the month of August. And, and in all actuality, our rate based on the number of people filing and receiving benefits is probably something more like eight to 10% unemployment. Um, so again, a lot of this is a, def uh, a definitional issue uh, in terms of how the data is collected and how it's recorded, but it has um, real impact and implications on people who are, are unemployed and receiving benefits. Thank you very much. Joe Lee, Local 22. Can you hear me okay? We can. Um, I wanted to touch on the uh, massless wedding uh, in Woodstock that happened on Saturday where 40 or so people weren't wearing masks. Um, considering the wedding that happened in Maine um, and the eight deaths that followed uh, due to the spread um, and in line with the Champlain Orchard outbreak, I was wondering if there uh, was any testing being offered to the employees at uh, Woodstock Inn. Um, again, I saw the photo of myself and uh, was concerned after seeing that. I asked our commissioner and uh, our secretary Curley as well, Commissioner yeah. Sherling, uh, Secretary Curley, to look into it, to contact the uh, Woodstock Inn where the picture was taken uh, to see if we could come uh, to make sure that it was valid, uh, first of all, and then uh, and find out what really happened. Uh, because uh, again, it appeared uh, from the photo uh, to violate uh, a lot of the guidance that we provided. But I'm going to let Commissioner Sherling uh, provide you with an update as to what, uh, what was found when they uh, communicated with the Woodstock Inn themselves. Now, good afternoon. Uh, as the governor indicated, Secretary Curley and I uh, spoke at length yesterday with uh, the management team at the Woodstock Inn. Um, it turns out that uh, they've been in close contact with the Agency of Commerce for uh, several weeks and actually even uh, before that to try to do their, their best to ensure compliance. Uh, same sort of story we've heard from many Vermont businesses who are in close contact uh, consistently with the state and local officials to try to do their best to to find a path to compliance. And uh, they indicated this was the first uh, event of its size that they have uh, hosted. Um, the wedding was originally supposed to be 125 people. There were actually about 25 who did not travel as a result of our, our quarantine requirements and travel restrictions. So uh, it was uh, reduced in size as a result of that. Uh, all guests were screened on arrival uh, for temperatures. They also uh, the one staying at the hotel uh, completed the attestation form that's required uh, by the Agency of Commerce uh, and the guidance that's been promulgated. Um, they walked us through a variety of the logistics around um, how guests were seated and how they moved uh, around. Uh, they actually had assigned seating uh, in pods that related to where uh, either a travel party or a familial unit. Uh, and they were given uh, drinks as they uh, sat, which may account for some of the, the unmasking. If you look carefully at the photograph, you'll actually see that they're um, laterally distanced in those pods by about six feet, um, but things did appear to uh, sort of fall down a little bit. Um, the distance between the rows may not have been uh, six feet. So um, we, we did share those concerns. Uh, they actually proactively had reached out to the Agency of Commerce earlier in the day uh, to, to gain some additional guidance and to have a conversation. Um, so we're confident that together with the, the plans that they have uh, in place, uh, both retroactively and the things they've learned from this particular event, that, uh, that things are, are gonna go as well as possible. Um, are there any consequences for businesses, especially as the hospitality industry here in Vermont is now back to 100%? Um, are there any consequences if these kinds of businesses don't comply with the mask mandate? There are potentially, uh, as has been the posture since the beginning, uh, education and engagement is the, the first uh, line of inquiry. And 
in the event we get residents uh, uh, hesitancy or, or, or reticence to that. Um, we do have uh, close communication with the Attorney General's office uh, to uh, add another layer of potential uh, education and then uh, requests for compliance and or orders uh, as necessary. And at this time, we don't know if there are any cases associated with the Woodstock wedding? No known cases uh, at this stage. All right, thank you. Just to, uh, as well, to clarify, um, the entire hospitality sector is not back at 100%. Uh, lodging is back to 100, but the, uh, um, but restaurants uh, are not. And uh, as well, uh, the guidelines still exist, even for those uh, in lodging. Um, you know, gathering sizes uh, are limited to 150 outside, 75 inside, uh, and many other provisions. So. Uh, we expect uh, those uh, guidelines to be adhered to, uh, but uh, but I just want to make sure that everyone understands uh, it's not 100% throughout uh, the hospitality sector. All right, Ed, Newport Daily Express. Yes, good afternoon. I'm going to return to a uh, question from last week uh, when you uh, indicated that there had been a little bit of an upsurge in the uh, COVID outbreak um, up in Quebec. Uh, for a lot of people who have families on either side of the border, uh, it's been a while since they've been able to see each other. What metrics are you looking for that would allow at least some some limited amount of border crossing for family? Yeah, I just and want... Is there anything that can happen, but is there any possible chance that the borders would be open by Christmas? Yeah, just, just to be clear, uh, I have no authority uh, to open up the border or restrict the border uh, at this point in time. This is a federal decision uh, in conjunction with uh, with Canada. So uh, it's between country to country, not state uh, to, uh, to to country or, or province. Um, so um, having said that, uh, again, we're concerned about the numbers, uh, but uh, but hope uh, they get their numbers back down to where they were before because they were. Uh, right in line uh, in Quebec uh, with what, uh, what Vermont was doing. Um, so we'll see what happens. Uh, hopefully uh, we'll come to uh, some conclusion on this, uh, that everyone will follow the guidelines in, in Canada and here in the States, uh, and then we get back to some sort of normal. But I, I don't believe that will be until we have some sort of vaccine in place uh, that's safe and uh, can be widely uh, distributed uh, throughout uh, throughout the country as well as into Canada as well. And that will take some time. Uh, Christmas will be out, for yeah. sure. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. Steve, Steve, any KTV? Hi. Hi, Steve. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Great, thanks. Uh, I've got a couple questions for Dr. Levine, if I may. Um, Dr. Levine, I've had some viewers request that I look into uh, how this happened and how we could prevent it from happening again. And um, uh, it appears that uh, some some uh, some virologists have speculated that uh, or suggested that if this virus was zoonotic, that it would have mutated by now, suggesting that it had escaped from a lab. And due to the screw-ups that we had at the U.S. lab, uh, Dr. Fauci had licensed uh, the Wuhan lab and approved funding for it um, uh, back a few years ago. Um, and this included gain-of-function research, which is uh, actually gain-of-function, meaning they're making it more virulent or more dangerous, from what I understand. And, uh, and that now uh, the U.S. Can, can do this research again. Uh, in the December uh, uh, 2017 uh, edition of Nature, uh, it's titled U.S. Lips Ban on uh, Risky Pathogen Research. And the NIH will again fund uh, research that makes viruses more dangerous. 
Um, how do we how do we ensure that something like this doesn't happen again? I guess. And, and do do we acknowledge that it that it could or might have happened? And how do we prevent this from happening again? Very happy to pass this question on to Dr. Levine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> so, Steve, I think what it boils down to is. Uh, something neither you nor I nor anyone else uh, really knows, and that has to do with the theories. Um, and we do know in this country there are labs that are very um, high level protected labs, if you will. I think they call them level four or level five, um, dealing with pathogens that we don't want to go outside of a laboratory setting. Um, and I'm quite uh, sure that the security around that uh, is quite good. Um, anything that happens overseas, I'm less sure about. And frankly, um, I know Dr. Fauci's name has been inserted into this discussion a lot, uh, not just by yourself, I mean by many others. But as far as I'm concerned, this goes under the rubric of conspiracy theories that uh, I can't really comment on because uh, they're beyond our ability to, the, the, right, the, they're about beyond our ability to uh, really show how much veracity there is with regard to them. However, with the zoonotic issue, uh, we do have uh, good knowledge of uh, many viruses that have actually come our way uh, through that pathway, meaning for those who aren't aware of the word zoonotic, things that existed more in the animal population and then made the jump to the human population, as has been stated for COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, coronaviruses by their nature generally aren't known to be rapid mutators, uh, so that in itself may explain uh, some of what we're seeing or not seeing right now. Um, but in terms of how would we, would we prevent that, um, whether you subscribe to the laboratory hypothesis where it really is uh, maintaining very strict and high security protocols and precautions, or whether you subscribe to the zoonotic pathway where it is mother nature to some extent, but mother nature merging with circumstances like what apparently happened in Wuhan, if we believe that, with an open air market, with uh, lots of things being sold um, that were already dead, but also things that are alive that were being sold and in close quarters to one another, allowing transmission for a respiratory virus to happen very quickly. So, you know, the, the total final word isn't in. So hard to tell you what would be preventive in this regard. Okay, and one more if I may. Uh, are, you, uh, uh, are you familiar with the Center for uh, Health Security? Yes. And have you attended any of their, uh, any of their workshops like Event 201 or the uh, Clade X uh, pandemic exercise? I have not. Have you? Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm just an armchair epidemiologist. I was just wondering if you had uh, if, if you had attended their workshops because I, I guess they had run some to be you know in to be prepared for something like this in the event that something like this happens. Yeah, no, it, you know, I think my final word on this would be uh, much like. I've said previously is the nation at large needs to learn a lesson from this, uh, many lessons, but one lesson is underfunding of public health, underfunding of emergency and especially pandemic preparedness. Um, and again, not pointing a finger at one administration or another because this is historic. It goes across multiple parties, multiple administrations. Um, I, I think this will have been the wake up call so that pandemic preparedness and other emergency preparedness uh, budgets are more robust at this point going forward. Thank you. 
agree. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, no one can argue with that, that's for sure. Um, thank you all. Alec, News 7. Alec, News 7. Hello. Um, everybody hear me good? We can. All right, awesome, thank you. All right, so my question, um, and I guess a follow-up um, to a lot of these questions that have been answered um, is in regards to traveling uh, as we enter uh, the winter season. Um, economically, how has COVID-19 impacted the ability to travel, uh, to travel in and out of state? Um, how can, how, how is that? Yeah, it, it obviously has affected travel uh, in and out of the state. Uh, I think in general, uh, people are cautious. Uh, they aren't traveling as much as they did before. Um, we see it with uh, some of our uh, counters uh, that, uh, that are on the ports of entry, uh, where we've seen maybe a you know, 30, 35% decline. I know Commissioner Pichek uh, has also uh, has data uh, that shows uh, there has been a decline in the number of people traveling to Vermont. Some of it's due to our guidelines, some of it's due to, uh, again, uh, some of uh, the sectors, the hospitality sector, uh, lodging and so forth. <clears throat> but a lot of it uh, is just uh, people are, are being very care careful and, uh, and not traveling as much. Uh, and, as, and as far as businesses are concerned, especially you small businesses, and we move into the winter um, yeah, and, and continue the fall season as well, how can businesses continue to ensure a safe and COVID-free environment? Well, by adhering to all the guidelines that we've laid out, um, they're really pretty simple in some respects. Uh, the travel policies are important. That's individual. Uh, but making sure people wear a mask, stay home when sick, uh, wash your hands a lot, stay separated from others. I mean, these are just very simple things that people can do uh, to help uh, in trying to to at least uh, confine this and stop the spread here in Vermont and elsewhere as well. Yeah, definitely. All right, thank you very much for your time, Governor. That's it. All right, thank you very much for tuning in. We'll see you again on Friday.